All right, here we go. Uh, we have two sections to cover. I'll take any questions you have on homework first. Got questions on homework? Got some questions? No. I have a question, but it's like from 6.2. I don't care. Go ahead. Let's do it. What is it? Um, I'm doing it. I love how you print them out, too. It's so professional. Um, it just, I'm have just finding, um, it's just finding an integral, um, solving the differential equation, y odd prime equals square root of x over 7y. Like so? That's it. Okay, let's do it. It's a differential equation. y prime is dy dx. What you want to do is call it separate the variables. You want to get the 7y over here with the y. You want to get the dx over here with that square root. Okay, that's the, uh, it's the first thing you do with differential equations. Okay, day one, different equations, separate variables. Okay, integrate each side. Integral 7y dy, 7y squared over 2. Now you get a constant here, but you also get a constant over here. And you may as well take the constants to one side and have one constant. That's x to the 1 half. That's x to the 3 halves times 2 thirds plus a constant. Now, what more they want you to do with that, I don't know. Um, I would probably leave it like that and give that as an answer. And, hey, Vitaly, how you doing, kid? I would leave it like that. Uh, you could multiply by 2. You could divide by 7. You could take the square root. I'm not sure what course compass, I mean, uh, web assign wants. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions at all? Chapter 6, Chapter 7, whatever. Okay. 62 parts. Great Scott. All right. Electrical wires suspended between two tires form a catenary. That's our cost function. Okay. Find the length, okay? We want to find the length of that suspended wire. We have to find the length of that. We're going to use the length of a curve. The length of a curve is the integral, a to b, square root of um, 1 plus the derivative squared dx. That's our length function, okay? We did that uh, last time, all right? Okay, the towers are 40 meters apart, so if I go from 0 to 20, say, or I'll go from negative 20 to 20. Okay, so here we go. The length is equal to the integral from negative 20 to 20, square root of 1 plus the derivative squared. Now, you're going to have to take the derivative of that function, y equals 20 cosh. x over 20. Okay? And take the derivative. When you take the derivative of this, it's cosh u form. The derivative of cosh u is cinch u, okay? du dx. And what happens when you take the derivative of x over 20, you get 1 over 20 to cancel out this 20. So you end up with cinch u times 1 20th, which cancels out the 20. Okay, that's the derivative. With me on that? Derivative of cos u is sin u du dx. The du dx. Yeah, because when you take the derivative of the x over 20, the du dx part, that's 1 20th. Okay. And that cancels out this 20. Okay, so the arc length is equal to the integral from negative 20 to 20. Oh, square root of 1 plus the derivative cinch squared. dx. Now, here's the thing. 1 plus cinch squared. What the heck is that? Well, there is a hyperbolic 
trig identity that says that that's equal to cosh squared. The square root of that is cosh. Now, you may not know that. I didn't go into those. I only did the derivative and integral forms. So I suppose if you wanted to do this, you could either do it in Mathematica, which will do it fine, or you say, OK, what the heck is cinch? Cinch is this. I mean, if you were really serious about doing this problem, you'd say cinch is equal to e to the x minus e to the opposite of x all over 2. But now x is x over 20. Okay. That's the definition of cinch. Remember I did that definition? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know you don't like this. I don't like it either. And when you square this, what happens? You're going to square this. Okay. So when you square this, you're going to get this one squared. When you square e to the x over 20, it's going to be e. And when you square this, you multiply it by 2. It's going to be x over 10. Okay. <laughs> this is exponential functions. When you square e to the x over 20, when you square it, you multiply by 2. Okay. So that gives you x over 10. You get a middle term, but that cancels out. It's twice the product. When you take the product of these two, they cancel. You get e to the 0 or 1. Okay, we got a positive and a negative coefficient there. You add them up to get e to the 0, which is 1. And it's going to be a minus, and it's twice the product. So it's minus 2 plus e. And when you square this, it's going to be a negative x over 10. Okay. And it's going to be over 4. It is ugly. Okay? It is ugly. Okay? It's, uh, it's a pretty ugly problem. But watch this. When you add 1 to this, watch what happens. I would never give you this in a test at all. But when you add 1 to this, this minus 2 so I'm adding 1 to this. When I add 1, I'm going to add it in the form of 4 over 4. Negative 2 plus 4 is a positive 2. OK. And what is this equal to? Believe it or not. It's equal to cosh squared of this x over 20. Okay? See, here's sin squared. It's got a minus. The cosh squared will have a plus. It's the only difference between the two. Cinch is with a minus. Did I define it here anywhere? Take the square root of that. What's that? Yeah, and then yeah, then you take the square root of that, and that's equal to cosh. So you end up integrating cosh. And that's pretty simple. So what you end up doing is this. It's the integral from negative 20 to 20. 1 plus sin squared is cos squared. Square root of that is cosh. OK? And now you can integrate it, OK? u is equal to x over 20. The du is 1 over 20. Multiply by 1 over 20 and 20. You end up with 20. The integral of cosh is cinch. And you're going to go from negative 20 to 20. You substitute it in. You're going to get 20 cinch 1 minus cinch negative 1. That would be your answer. OK? Is this 7.2? I don't know where it is. Where it is. No, this is the end of 6, right? Yeah, this is like 7. What, what are we going over today, the last two, 7.7 and 7.8? So this is like 7.6. No, this, oh, arc length, yeah, this is arc length. This is what we did yesterday. We did arc length and surface area, right? Yeah, this is an arc length. Yeah, yesterday. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Monday. Monday. All right. That's what it is. It's not so much that the arc length is bad. What's bad is this, this, this stuff with the, uh, the exponential function is bad. Okay, that's what it is. So. Bottom line is, I wouldn't give you that. Yeah, I can't okay. compare it to the answer. The answer is, when you substitute in 20, you're going to get 20 cinch 
20 over 20, that's 20, cinch 1 minus the 20, cinch negative 1. And now you can do that in terms of exponential functions, replace the x with 1 in the definition of cinch, which is e to the x minus e to the opposite of x all over 2. I don't know what form they want it in, okay, but that would be the, your answer. Burns. Yeah. Can you move your finger? Oh, sorry. Can you do one more for me? I'll do whatever you want. Wait a second. I'm going to make sure it trends okay. I'm good. Okay. What do you think? I mean, well, I, I agree. <laughs> I agree. But the thing is, it's, it's an arc length form, and it's the, the, the integral itself, I mean, what you have to do is not that bad. What's bad is all this other junk. Okay. Uh, oh, wait. Does this mean you got other ones here? There's three total. Okay. Uh, okay, let me do with her next one. Her next one is eight and a half foot pounds of work is required to compress a spring two inches from its natural length. So here we go. Eight and a half foot pounds. What you do with spring problems is to solve for the spring constant first, K. This is Hooke's law. Eight and a half foot pounds, that's the force. That's required to compress it two inches. Okay, well, you got foot pounds, feet there, and you got two inches. I would go with one sixth of a foot. I would, you'd have to be consistent with your units. Okay, so K, okay, and that's one sixth of a foot. Okay, because it's a spring two inches from its natural length. Now, whether you compress a spring two inches, or extend it two inches really doesn't matter. It's the same amount of force, okay? So I'm gonna just use one sixth. Multiply both sides by six, I get 51. K is 51. Multiply both sides by six, okay? Now, find the work required to compress the spring an additional one half inch. Great Scott. So. Where are we going now? Here's what we've done. We compressed it two inches. We're at negative two right now. Where are we going to go? From negative two to negative two and a half, negative five halves. That's the additional one half inch compression. From negative two, that's where we're starting, to negative two and a half. Okay? That's in inches. I'm going to I'm going to convert these to feet though. Okay, 51 dx. So, here's what we got. Negative 2 inches, that's negative 1 sixth of a foot. Oh boy. Wait, why do you have to convert them? Well, because this is in foot pounds. Uh, this is in foot pounds and feet. This is in inches. So I'm going to have to take this and divide that by 12 as well. When I divide that by 12, it's 5 24ths. Boy, this problem stinks, huh? This is what it is. Okay. Just plain messy is what it is. Okay, is this okay? 5 fourths feet. That's two and a half inches. If you multiply it by 12, yeah, that's, that works. So, uh, KX. It's KX. Yes, there is an X. Thank you, Damien. Okay, there you go. All right, so we get, here's kx. That's where we have to integrate the force. So it's 51 x squared over 2 from negative 1 sixth to negative 5 fourths. 51 halves. 5 fourths squared. That's 25 5 76 minus. One six, one thirty six. Okay. Then what? Well, get a common denominator here. Uh, this is twenty four squared. This is six. If I multiply this by uh, how many times does thirty six go into five seventy six? Does anybody know this? Can somebody do that? Five seventy six divided by thirty six. How much? Sixteen. Sixteen. Thank you. So I've got fifty one halves. 576, I have 25 minus 16. 
Okay, multiply by 16 over 16. That gives me 9 times 51, 459 over 12, 15, 1152. That would be in foot pounds of work. Try that. That's what I say. Guess what? It can be simplified. Don't try that. I can see a 9 goes into each of these. 9 goes in here 51 times. And 9 goes into here 1, 2, 128. It's 51 over 128 foot pounds. Boy, good thing I noticed it. Otherwise, you'd get it wrong and blame me. That's the exact answer right there. <clears throat> That is one stupid problem again. I don't know what Bozo set up these homeworks, but boy, they're stupid problems. Oh, two decimal places. So do the division and yeah. put it in for two decimal places. OK, third one. Find the arc length of the graph of function over the indicated interval. 2 thirds x to the 3 halves plus 1. Oh, you got this one wrong. Melissa, what happened? OK, let's do it. Here's the problem. Y equals 2 thirds x to the 3 halves plus 1. And we're going to go from 0 to 4, I guess, huh? Is that what that looks like? I think. OK, arc length is the integral from 0 to 4. Square root of 1 plus the derivative squared dx. That's our arc length formula. 0 to 4, 1 plus the derivative. When you take the derivative, 3 halves comes out front, cancels the 2 thirds, x to the 1 half. And you're going to square that. The derivative of 1 is 0, dx. OK? No. What happened is it's, it's gone. When you take the derivative of this expression, the 3 halves comes out front, and it cancels the 2 thirds. Oh, okay. okay? And then you get x to the 1 half. That's what this is. But I'm going to square that. So I get the integral from 0 to 4, square root of 1 plus x dx. I think, I think I mentioned this last class, that this is one of those that you can do. There's very few problems that you can actually do the arc length, because there's very few integrals you can do where you start with a function, you take its derivative, you square it, you add 1, and take the square root, and you end up with something where you can actually integrate it. This is one such example. I think I mentioned this last time. Okay? So, what do you have? u to the 1 half power. Okay? u to the n form. So, the integral is, this is u. The du is just dx. So, it's u to the 1 half. So, you have this. You don't even have to multiply by anything because you just have u to the 1 half du. You already have the du. All right, integrate this, you get u 3 halves times 2 thirds from 0 to 4. It's equal to 2 thirds. 4 plus 1 is 5 to the 3 halves. 5 to the 3 halves is 5 square roots of 5. I'm pretty sure I did a problem like this. We ended up with like a 10 square roots of 10 or something in there. You guys remember that? Damien? 10 square roots of 10 I do remember. Yeah, thank you, Nick. There you go. So there, the rest of you guys. All right. We can always check. Uh, that's true. We could, huh? Maybe we shouldn't. All right. Put a 0 in there, OK? And you get a 0, but you got to have a, you end up with a 1, so it's minus 1. You end up with your answer of 2 thirds times the quantity 5 squared to 5 minus 1. Now, uh, yeah. OK? So what do you do? You, they, they want it to, to three decimal places, so you just crank it out in your calculator. You do 5 squared to 5, you subtract 1, you multiply by 2, you divide by 3, and you get your answer. OK? Any questions on that? OK. Nick, go ahead. Let's do it. What the heck is all this? All right, hold on. Go, do it again. Three what? Well. 
three x cosh x minus three sin h sinh uh, x and I think they just want us to find the derivative for it. Okay, find the derivative of three x cosh x minus three sinh x. Yep, that's it. All right, let's do it. The derivative is, you got a product rule here. First times the derivative of the second. Derivative of cosh is sinh plus the second times the derivative of the first. Bless you. Bless you. Three. Wait, wait, what it, pro, how, product rule is just adding them, right? Yes. Yep. First times the derivative of the second plus second times the derivative of the first. Oh, okay. And you have to do it individually for each one. Yes. And minus the derivative of three cinch is three cosh. And guess what? These guys cancel. Your answer is three x cinch x. What about the second one for the cinch? The, three cinch? the derivative of cinch is cosh. That's this one here. It is cosh, yes. But don't you do the vice? Oh, you only do it when there's an x. In Correct. It's okay. not negative cosh? No. The derivative of cinch is cosh. The derivative of cosh is cinch. They're both positive. The, the rules for the hyperbolic trig functions are very similar to the rules for the trig function, but they differ, often by a sign. Sometimes they're the same, and sometimes they're a little bit different. Okay. Okay. Any others? Yeah, I got one more. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll bring it up here because I don't see it even. Let's take a look. You got to do a funky little trick there. Use the shell method seven here because the volume sounds are there. Plain reason about the y axis. Y equals the square root of x, and we're going to 16. Got it. Thank you. Here's the deal. Look at the square root of x. This is a solid of uh, revolution, volume of a solid of revolution. And they want you to use shells to find the volume generated by taking this area about the x-axis. Now, if we're going to use shells, we're going to have to take a rectangle this way. Okay. If we were to take rectangles this way, we would get disks. And the problem would be 10 times easier. Okay, but they want us to do shells, we'll do shells. All right, so let's whip this thing around the x-axis. We are going to generate shells. The volume is going to be equal to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to 16. Uh, wait, we got y's. The y's are going to go from 0 to 4. Okay, Because this is a delta y here, that means everything is in terms of y. Okay, 0 to 4, r, h, dy. This is shells. This is the shell method. Okay. That's equal to 2 pi, 0 to 4. Now, what's r? r is this distance right here. When we whip this rectangle about the x-axis, that'll be the radius through which this revolves. Okay? What is r equal to? That's exactly what it's equal to with stuff. It's the height above the x-axis, which is the square root of x. But I want everything in terms of y. So what is that distance above the x-axis? Y squared? Ah, no. Distance above the x-axis? Yes. Just the y, no? Just the y. That's exactly what it is. It's y. That's what a y coordinate is. It's the height above the x-axis. OK? H. H is this distance right here. Now, what the heck is that distance equal to? That distance is equal to this distance. What's that distance equal to? 16. Minus this distance, which adds x, 
but everything has to be in terms of y. So h is going to be 16 minus this x. But what's x equal to? y squared. That integral will give us that volume. That's the integral that you need for that problem. Wait, question. Mm -hmm. For a web of sign, is that how it looks like, having it sideways like that? Yeah, they, they give you a little so rectangle like there, right? Up and down, though, not sideways. Wait, did they say shells about the x-axis? Well, that's what was confusing me, because they got the rectangle okay. going. They're wait, 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 down. All right, hold on. Let, let, me, let me see what we got here. I thought they got... Wait, is that the one you just showed me? Yeah. Oh, it's nine, and went up to 16. Yeah, it does. Oh, no, that's the, that's the practice one, but it's the same thing, though. They both, <laughs> it's the exact thing, and they both. Oh, there's, wait, use the shell method. Yeah. Generated by revolve the plane. Wait, what's the rest of that sentence? <laughs> I assume, I want to let the y axis. It's because I'm looking at you. All right, all right, hold on, hold on, forget it, all right, forget it. I didn't want to interrupt. You seem like you're around like a roll. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Okay, here's the deal. All right, this would be this problem. That's not the problem that's asked. How, now, um, just still on that one. Okay, go ahead. It. So it's up to 16. Oh, that's, that's the thing. But what if you get the, the 0 to 4? Because the y, everything has to be in terms of y, and y is going to go from 0 to 4. To the height of the whole. Yes. Yeah. So you got to do these rectangles. Starting from here where y is 0 until you get to here where y is equal to 4. But for, for these, we're just we're, we're, we're rotating it around, around. Well, I was going around the x-axis. So what you're doing essentially is finding the surface area of... We're finding a volume here. No, but you're finding the area, the first the area, correct? And then... I'm finding, I, well, I'm finding the area of this rectangle that's produced. That's true, if that's what you mean. But there's a difference. There's a surface area problem that we did last time, and there's a volume of a solid revolution, which is what's being asked of him. So there's two separate things here. But is it the same thing as like finding the area of that whole just piece in 2D? In 2D, if you just look at it straight. If you want the area of this piece right here. And just rotating it around the wax. Isn't that the same thing? Well, but you can't say you're finding the area of that. You have to say you're finding the volume of the three-dimensional solid that's generated by taking that area about the y-axis. Okay. Okay? Okay. Right. okay, let's do the problem that's being asked of him. <laughs> All right, let's make sure I have this right now. It was y equals the square root of x. It was out to 16. Mm -hmm. I did have that much. It goes up to 4. I had that too. See that? I had this. Now, we want to take this about the y-axis. And we do want to use shells. Does it say use shells? Say exactly what it says. Use the shell method to set up and evaluate the integral that gives the volume of the solid generated by the revolution Okay, about the y-axis, so let's do it. So we're taking this rectangle about the y-axis. That'll generate that shell, okay? So, let's do it. That volume is equal to, now you'll notice the rectangle I have now is in terms of x, so everything is going to be in terms of x, okay? 2 pi. x is going to go from 0 to 16. R H D X. Okay. This is going to be R. This is going to be H. So, 2 pi. The integral from 0 to 16. What is R equal to? No. What is R equal to? Yes. X. X. The distance from the y-axis is x. Okay, that's it. When we, when we looked at it before, that's what it was before, too. But we had to change it because we were in terms of y. But that's what it is. That's x. H, this distance, what's that equal to? Um, whatever the height is, right? 
whatever the height is, which is equal to square root of x. Turns out this problem is pretty, the integral is pretty simple. Okay? Uh, wait, how is that square root of x? Because the height above the x-axis is y. Oh, is but what is y equal to? The square root of x. So the volume is equal to 2 pi, 0 to 16, x to the 3 halves dx. Multiply those out. Let's integrate it. So we get 2 pi, x to the 5 halves times 2 fifths from 0 to 16. See that again? Three halves. This is three halves when you, when you multiply these two guys. You add their exponents. Okay. You've got a one and a one half. It's one and a half when you add them, or three halves. Okay. Then you integrate it by adding one and dividing by the new exponent. So I'm going to get four pi over five. Okay. This here. I'm going to put a 16 in there. When I put a 16 to the five halves, you do 16 to the 1 half, 4 to the 5th power. 4 to the 5th power is 4, 16, 64, 256, 1024. Okay? It's 4 to the 5th power. Okay? When you put in 0, you get 0. Your answer, and you, you got it right there then, right? Yeah. Okay, good. You should put in 4,096 pi over 5. Now, how do they want the answer? This is the exact answer. If they want it to three decimal places, you may have to do it out to three decimal places. But this is the exact answer right here. Chuck that in there. Um, I have a question. Yes. Just algebra. Mm -hmm. um, for the five, five, five halves, how would you do it? Like, like I, yeah, I know you just did it, but I'm just pretty, can you repeat that? When you evaluate this for 16, mm -hmm. you're going to put 16 to the 5 halves. It's minus 0 to the 5 halves. You take the denominator first. That's the root. That's the square root of 16, 4. And then you take the exponent here, which is a power. It's 4, the square root of 16, to the fifth power. So it's 4 times 4 times 4 times 4 times 4. And that's what you get. Yeah, yeah that's good. Where, how did you know that was, uh, where it says 4 pi to the fifth? 4 pi. Right there. How did you know that was going to equal that? I did it. I just did it on my head. I just did 4, I just did four to the fifth power. But I, I, did, I did it. I said 4. I, I told you guys what it was. 4, 16. Yeah. 64, 256, 1024. You guys could do it. A yeah, no, <laughs> little bit of training, a little bit of work, you could do it. No sweat. How long are you uh, a math professor, teacher? How long? Since I was three years old. So I've been doing it for a long time. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. Um, I won't even tell you well, how many years I've been teaching this stuff, though, because you, you won't even believe me if I told you. But this is my 46th year teaching this stuff. So figure that out. My, my answer was... Started like, in 1970. Go ahead. My answer was like huge. Mine was 25. Huh? 16. Oh, you had, instead of 16, you had a 25? Yeah. Oh, you had to take the square root, which is 5, and then you had to do 5 to the 5th. So it would be like 120, 500? <laughs> 5 to the 5th would be 5, 25, 125, 625, 3125. 3125. 3125, and then you multiply that by 4. Right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. How are we doing? Awesome. Good deal. Nice. Okay, let's go on. We have two sections to do. We're going to do those tonight. We're going to finish the chapter. Monday, we're going to do a lab and review. And then next Thursday will be our test. Unfortunately, midterm grades are not due when I said. I said they would be due next Friday. 
the 13th at midnight. They're not. They do Thursday night at midnight. So here's what I'm doing. What's that? Well, you take your test. I correct it, I, uh, and I'll figure out your midterm grades when I get home. I mean, but your midterm grades pretty simple, right? It, doesn't really matter. it doesn't really matter. Basically, what I'm going to do is take your two tests. If you have two labs in, that's good. Some people already have two labs in. Okay, uh, some people only have one. The lab is not due until Friday at midnight, after the midterm grades. Uh, if you get the two labs in, that's fine. I'll count them. Okay. If you don't, I'll only count the one. It's when, not a big deal. When's this lab? This lab is due next Friday at midnight. Oh. Although I could make it Friday Friday after that. I don't care. What's that? Isn't this Friday? Isn't that? Well, that's the first one. The first one. Oh, the first one's due this Friday? Yes. Oh, okay. The first one's due this. Oh, that's right. I extended it out. I, you know, the labs, as long as they get in at some point, I don't okay. really care uh, about that. If you have labs in, I'll count them. They'll help you. If you don't have the labs in, I won't count it. That's all. It'll come down to your two tests, okay? Okay, let's finish up. You ready? We have two topics to do. Bless you. First topic is centroid. Now, this is uh, 7.6? 7. 7? Seven. Seven? Centroid of a lamina of constant density okay now what the heck is a lamina first of all a lamina is a two-dimensional region with density it has mass there's a region with mass Consider this a thin plate with a density function. So many grams per square centimeter, okay? And think of it as a thin plate with so many grams per square centimeter, it's gonna have a mass to it, okay? And that thin plate of that mass, this constant density, will have a centroid. What the heck is a centroid? Centroid, denoted X bar, Y bar, is the point at which this lamina will balance on the head of a pin. Okay. If you're an architect or you're an engineer designing something, a platform say, and you have to support it with a beam, you would put the beam where? Right at the centroid of that lamina. That's where you'd want that weight supporting beam to be located. Right at where the, all the mass of that lamina is considered to be concentrated. Okay? That's what you would do. Okay? So that's what we want to do. We want to find that centroid, that central point where that thing would balance on the head of a pin. Now to do that though, we need a couple of concepts. We need first of all the concept of a moment. Okay? Now let's start with a simple moment. A moment is equal to a mass times a distance. If we have a fulcrum here, we have a seesaw kind of a thing. And let's suppose we put a 20 pound weight here at a distance of four feet, say, from the fulcrum. And we take another weight, let's say a 30 pound weight, okay? Let's take a 30 pound weight. And let's suppose this is two feet from the fulcrum. This system is not in equilibrium. It's not balanced. Because the two moments, each moment generated, they're different. If you look at the moment generated by this, this weight, this mass here times its distance, let's call that M1, and let's call this M2. The first moment is this mass, 20 pounds, times this distance of four feet, we get 80 foot pounds. I may be playing loose with the, the mass units, which are really slugs or something, but we're going to use just use pounds, okay? I don't want to get messed up with the units here. The second moment generated by this guy would be its 30 pound weight at a negative two feet, it's two feet to the left. That would be a negative 60 foot pounds. Why, because the center point in your 
Yeah, this corresponds to the origin, exactly right. Consider this a number line, positive four and negative two. Anything to the left would be negative, anything to the right is gonna be positive. Now, here's what we wanna do. We wanna locate the center of this system. We wanna find its centroid. And you find that by taking the sum of the two moments, which would be 80, plus a negative 60, divided by the mass, the total mass of the system, okay? You got a 30 pound weight and you got a 20 pound weight, okay? So what do we have? 80 plus a negative 60 is 20, divided by 50, we get 2 fifths. What does that represent, that 2 fifths? That 2 fifths, that point right here, 2 fifths, to the right of our original center would give us the centroid of the system. If we were to locate the fulcrum at that point, the system would be in balance. It would be in equilibrium. Let's test it out. Okay, let's do it. So here we go. Okay, is everybody okay so far? You guys do this in physics or something, right? Well, maybe. Not yet. Not yet? What's that? It's towards the end. Oh. All those physics people are going to get mad at me. Ooh. All right, here we go. So I'm going to take the same system. I'm going to locate my fulcrum now, two-fifths okay, of a foot to the right at where it was. So I've got my 20-pound weight. Okay. But now what's its distance from the fulcrum? I've moved the fulcrum two-fifths of a let's see, it was here. Now it's the old fulcrum, and I moved it two-fifths this way. So what is this distance now? Three and three-fifths. Three and three-fifths. Yeah, nice problem. Okay. Let's say 3.6. Okay. 3.6 feet. Okay. What is this distance where my 30-pound weight is? Okay, that's going to be, if I move it over uh, two-fifths, 2.4, very nice. Okay, that's 30 pounds here, that's what that is. So now let's find out if the system's in equilibrium. We'll take the sum of the two moments. We've got moment one, which is our 20, times 3.6, okay, 72. Let's take our second moment, which is our negative 2.4, our 30 pounds, times a negative 2.4, and we will get a negative 32 foot pounds, okay? Mass times distance, mass times distance, and our centroid, okay, is equal to the sum of the masses, the sum of the moments, divided by the total mass, we're going to get negative 72 and a positive 72 to get zero. The mass is still uh, 50 pounds, and it's equal to zero. That tells us we have equilibrium. It's balanced right at our fulcrum. That's where the centroid is, OK? That's equal to zero by locating it over that 2 fifths. OK, now, do we care about this? Actually, no. OK, this is a discrete system. You got uh, discrete masses and discrete distances. We don't really care about that, but it does illustrate what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a continuous system. Let's take an f of x and a g of x. from A to B. Okay. We're going to do the same thing, however. We're going to find the sum of all the moments from the x-axis and divide by the total mass. That'll give us an x, that'll give us a y-bar when we take the moments from the x-axis. That'll give us a y-bar. And then we'll take the sum of all the moments from the y-axis divided by the mass. That'll give us an x-bar. 
and we'll have the centroid of this system by doing just essentially what we just did, find the average moment from the x-axis, from the y-axis, to get x bar, y bar, the centroid of this system, where that system would be balanced, okay? Now, in order to do that, we have to find the mass of this lamina. Let's do that first, because that's what we're going to have to divide by the total mass. The mass is equal to, now, we've got constant density here. Our density function is rho, okay? Rho is used for density function always. That's pretty much universal, okay? I think even physics people do that. Rho? Rho, yeah. Rho is a uh, Greek letter. It's used for density function. It's like alpha and theta are used for angles, and uh, you know, uh, kappas are used for one thing, and sigmas are used for sums, and deltas are used for differences, and things like that. Pretty standard, okay? Rho is a density function. So what's the mass of this lamina here? It's going to be its area times its density. The density is a constant. So the mass is going to be the integral from A to B, top minus bottom, okay, times the density function, a constant, dx. That's the mass of that lamina. Now, I got to tell you, it's way more, I hate to say this, but it's way more interesting at Calc 3. In Calc 3, you've got a density function that varies. The density is different at every point. And that makes for a much more interesting problem, to find the centroid of that lamina of varying density. But that's a Calc 3 thing, and you need double integrals to do that. But anyhow, this will give us the mass of this lamina, OK? Is that reasonable, what we got there? I don't hear any no's. I don't hear any yeses, but I don't hear any no's. And I'll choose to do that. I'll that's a reasonable thing, right? OK, that's the mass of this lamina. It's its area times its density. Okay, think of the density, so many grams per square centimeter, so many, so many pounds per square foot. So what's the, what's the mass of the thing? It's its density function, so many pounds per square foot times the square feet, the area. Square feet cancel, and you get pounds, all right? That's the mass of the thing, OK? OK, the more important thing is we got to find, first of all, let's do the, the uh, Moments, the sum of all the moments from the x-axis. Okay. Okay, here's where we have. I'm going to draw a rectangle in here with a delta x. What I want to do is find that average moment from the x-axis. That average moment will occur at this point. That's the midpoint between these two functions right here. Okay? This distance is what I need for the distance that this moment is from the x-axis. Okay? What I need to do is figure out what the coordinates of this point is, the midpoint of this rectangle. Can someone tell me what the y coordinate of this point is, because the x coordinate is just whatever the x, uh, the x, x sub i is. But what's the y coordinate of the midpoint of this rectangle? The That's exactly what it is. Got a weight trend. Okay. So this distance right here. So here's what I have for my moment. This moment, the ith moment, is going to be approximately equal to this distance. This distance is equal to the distance from the x-axis to the midpoint of this point. The midpoint here is the sum of the two functions divided by 2. That's how you get the middle of this. You add this plus this and divide by 2. That's how you get the midpoint. Okay? Now, that's the distance. The moment we said was a mass times a distance. What's the mass of this rectangle? The mass of this rectangle is its area times the density. What's the area of this rectangle? The area of that rectangle is top minus bottom okay, top minus bottom times the delta x. 
That gives me the area of the rectangle times its density function will give me the mass of this rectangle. This will be the mass of that rectangle times that distance to the midpoint. We have a mass times a distance. We have a moment. We have a mass times a distance. Okay? We're going to sum up all those moments. The total moment that we get, we'll take the limit, as n goes to infinity, of the sum of all these moments. Now check this out. Density function's a constant, I can take that out front. I have f of x plus g of x. Can you guys see this? Is this, is it okay? f of x minus g of x times a delta x. I'm going to sum up all those moments, all those mass times densities, okay? All those things. What do I have? What kind of a sum do I have here? Thank you. That's a Riemann sum. I've got some function of x here. I get sums and differences of function of x times a delta x. This is a Riemann sum. How do we evaluate that? With an integral. Okay, this is the moment from the x-axis. This gives me a y-coordinate, okay? All right, this is the moment from the x-axis. You ready? Did you get that on? Okay. Wow. We all set? So, the moment from the x-axis is equal to rho density times the integral from A to B of the sum of the two functions divided by 2 times the difference of the two functions times dx. That is the moment from the x-axis. It's the distance right to the middle okay, times an area this times delta x times a density, which gives us a mass times a distance. Okay? It's a sum of all those mass distances. That's the moment from the x-axis. All right, let's do the moment from the y-axis. Here we go. I'm going to go back to this. This is the distance I use to generate the moment from the x-axis. The moment from the y-axis is this distance. So let me tell you that that distance is equal to x. That's correct. The distance from the y-axis is x. It's that simple. So the moment from the y-axis is the density function. Integral from a to b. x. f of x minus g of x top minus bottom dx. The only difference is this is my distance from the y uh, from the x-axis. It's to the midpoint. This is the distance from the y-axis. It's whatever the x-coordinate is. Stretching. You're stretching. What's that? Definitely. Well, we're almost there. Here we go. X bar, y bar is equal to. Here we go. X bar. That's the x-coordinate of the centroid is equal to the moment from the y-axis. The moment from the y-axis actually is an x-coordinate. It goes to the right, OK? Divided by the mass. Y-bar, the moment from the, the uh, y-coordinate of the centroid, OK, is the moment from the x-axis divided by the mass, OK? There you go. You ready? Let's do a problem. Let's do, um, this is what you got to know right here. Okay. So let's do a pop. Let's suppose we have water. The 
centroid of that lamina of constant density rho. Okay? Now, can someone give me an approximate point that would be just, just an approximation of what uh, the centroid would be just by looking at this thing right in here? What's that? Maybe a little bit more to the left because there's a bigger area over here that could pull it over to the left. Good point. It's around one half the x, uh, but maybe more to the left, like Nick says. But it's going to be greater than one half. It's going to be above this line, certainly. So it's going to be up here somewhere. That's what we should find. That's where that would balance on the head of a pin, right there. That's where the weight, you can consider all the weight of that lamina concentrated at that single point. Okay, let's do it. First of all, let's find the mass. Mass is equal to density, the integral, 0 to 1, top minus bottom. That's equal to density. x to the 1 half is x to the 3 halves times 2 thirds minus x squared over 2, 0 to 1. That's equal to rho. You've got 2 thirds minus 1 half. Okay. That's equal to 4 6 minus 3 6. That's equal to 1 6. That's rho over 6. That's the mass of that lamina, rho over 1 6. Whatever rho happens to be, whatever that density function is, it's that divided by a 6. So you just divided by 6. Integral of x and square root of x? Yes, that's what I did. Now, I'm going to find the moment from the y-axis. Okay, the moment from the y-axis, this distance here. Okay, that's equal to rho, the integral from zero to one. X, the difference in the two functions, top minus bottom, square root of x minus x dx. G of X is always at the top? Uh, no. Uh, not necessarily. It's always top minus bottom. It may be G of X. It may not be. It depends on how the book or whatever it is you're doing it sets it up. It's always top minus bottom, though. Which top? This here. This one's above this one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. So, it's rho, integral, 0 to 1. Multiply this. You get X to the 3 halves minus x squared dx. That's equal to rho x to the 5 halves times 2 fifths minus x cubed over 3 from 0 to 1. That's equal to rho 2 fifths minus 1 third. That's equal to 1 15th. That's equal to rho over 15. 2 fifths here because when I added 1 to the 3 halves, that made it 5 halves. And then I have to divide by 5 halves, which is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal 2 fifths. But isn't that times 0? When I substitute in 0, I get 0, yeah. Right. Yeah, substituting in one, you just get the two fifths. Okay, that's all right. Not a problem. Moment from the x-axis is equal to rho integral 0 to 1. Now, the moment from the x-axis, my distance is the average of the two functions. So what do you have to do? You have to take the square root of x plus x over 2 times the square root of x minus x dx. Okay? Mass times distance. That's what a moment is. I can take the 1 half out front, and I will get rho over 2. Now, it's kind of interesting what happens here because if you, you multiply this out, it's a difference of two squares. That's what always happens. Square root of x, square root of x is x x times x is x squared. Okay. 
get no middle term because the plus you get difference of two squares. So you end up with rho over 2, x squared over 2, x cubed over 3, from 0 to 1. That gives you rho over 2, put in a 1, you get 1 half, minus 1 third, that's equal to 1 sixth times rho over 2, it gives you rho over 12. This is pretty cool. So here's what I have. Watch this now. X bar, Y bar. The centroid of this lamina. The point at which this thing would balance in the head of a pin is equal to the moment from the Y axis, M sub Y, rho over 15. divided by the mass, rho over 6. What's that? Can you see it? Yeah, it's going to be 6 fifteenths and we're going to simplify it. We're going to get 2 fifths. And then the y bar, okay, y bar is the moment from the x-axis, rho over 12, over the mass of rho over 6. Now, what happens here? The rows cancel. We don't care. The density function cancels, which is what you would expect. It doesn't matter what the density function. Nick? Where does the rho over 6 come from? The mass. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The density functions just cancel right out. Okay? As long as they're constant, we don't care what they are. They just cancel right out. You're left with... 6 fifteenths, here I'll simplify that in a second, and you're left with 6 twelfths. When you divide by 3, you get 2 fifths and 1 half. This is what Nick said. Nick said to the left of the center. It's at 2 fifths. The, the exact midpoint would be 1 half. This is at 2 fifths, a little bit to the left. Why? Because you've got more area of over here above this line. And it's equal to one half on the y's, okay? The one half on the y's would be, okay, if I go to the left a little bit, here, here's, here's one half, one half on this line. Okay, we got two fifths, one half, so it's all like, oh shoot, it's like right here. It's a little bit to the left, but it's equal to the one half, okay? This is where the lamina has its centroid right there. Oh, I don't know. I kind of botched up the diagram here. Make a big circle. There you go. That's right it right there. there. <laughs> All right. That's how you do it. That's how you find the centroid of. Uh, uh, yeah. What? Well, you guys got any questions or what? What's that? It isn't really too bad. We'll probably have questions after next homework. Hey, after the next homework, when you have questions that are uh, of 168 parts to it, yeah, you may have a question or two. All right, I got one more section to go. You ready? Okay. I'm willing to take any questions on this, though. Adrian, what do you think, kid? Hmm? My best calling my name. <laughs> oh, wow. All right. Okay. All right. Next is fluid force. Okay. Here's the deal. Let's suppose this is the problem. That's the top. We're in a tank of water, say, right here. That's the top of the water right there. Okay. That, that is the top of the water. We're in the water. We're submerged in the water. <coughs> what we want to do is calculate the fluid force on that table right there. Okay? Let's say that table is five feet um, in the water, five feet under the, the, in the water. Okay? How much fluid force is on that table? Well, I'll tell you. The fluid force on that table would be equal to 
the area of the table, let's say the table is uh, uh, five feet long, okay, two feet wide. That would be the area of the table. The depth of the table, I said, was, what did I say? Five feet underneath the water, five feet below the top, okay, times the density of water. And let's say the water is uh, 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. That's the density of water. We'll, we'll do 60, okay? We'll just say 60, okay? This is 60 uh, pounds per cubic foot. How much force is on that table? Well, it's equal to the area of the table, 10 square feet here, times the 5 foot depth, times the density of water. Okay, that would be 50 times the 60, it would be 3,000 pounds. That would be the fluid force on that table. 3,000 pounds of force on that table, if that's five feet underneath uh, from the top of the water, okay? That would be the weight of all the water that's pushing down at that table. That's what it is, okay? There's no calculus necessary here. Okay, it's straightforward because it's a constant along the whole table. We got a horizontal orientation. Now, what happens if we take that table and we give it a vertical orientation? Okay, now what happens is if we were to take this and flip it this way and give it a vertical orientation, the force on each piece of this table would be different because each piece of the table is at a different depth. And we would have to sum up all those forces to get the total force on the table. And that means calculus, okay? We're going to sum up all those different forces. End up with a Riemann sum that we can evaluate with an integral. That's what we're going to do, okay? So let's start. So here's what we got. Now when you do these problems, Always, the x-axis is the top of the water, okay? You always do that. X-axis is the top of the water. So what I'm doing is taking this uh, table, we'll, we'll start with a rectangle. We'll, we'll start with this rectangle. Because we're going to have to make it a little bit more complicated as we go along here, okay? Let's suppose we have uh, the top of the table here is at a depth of five feet. And this is at seven feet, okay, and the length of the table we said was five feet, I believe, okay. So that's our table, okay. Now it's got a vertical orientation under the water. What we want to do is find the total force of the water on this table. And we're going to do it by doing the following. We're going to divide this up into pieces. Here's one such piece. Now, given the way I've drawn that rectangle, what variable are we going to be integrating with respect to? X or Y? X. Y. Y. Yeah, it's a Y. Good shot, though, Melissa. You can try it. It's a Y. This is a delta Y here, okay? When you have a rectangle this way and that's a delta Y, everything is going to be in terms of Y. These problems are always done in terms of Y, okay? Let's figure out the fluid force on this one strip right here, whose width is delta y. Fluid force, that I force, is approximately equal to, well, what's it equal to? It's equal to its depth here. And that's equal to a negative y, okay? You gotta be a little bit careful on that. If this thing is at six feet below, this point is at zero, negative six, the depth is at six feet. It's the opposite of y, okay? You have to take the opposite of y. So the depth is negative y, okay? The area of this one rectangle is going to be its length. Now this length is five, it's a constant. That won't always be the case, but it is a constant here. The the width of that rectangle is a delta y, okay? This gives me the area of the rectangle. This gives me the depth of that rectangle. 
and we need to multiply by the density of water. I'm going to use uh, rho for that. Okay. Normally for water, you use 60, 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, something like that. Okay. Okay. That's the fluid force on that one strip. Say, say that again. Delta Y is this thickness. The yeah, that's the th width or height or whatever you want of this rectangle. The length of this is 5. That's the area of the rectangle. That's the depth. That's the density of water. Okay? So, what are we going to do? We're going to sum them all up. The total force on this table, or whatever it happens to be, the total force, okay, is going to be equal to the limit, as n goes to infinity, of the sum of all these forces. Okay? In this case, it's going to be um, a negative y, a 5, a density rho, and a delta y, as I sum them all up. Well, what kind of a sum do we have? Riemann sum. Well, the total force on this table is going to be negative. Density function is a constant, take it out front. Uh, as we go from negative 7 in this case to, set, to plot a negative 5 at the bottom of the top, okay, of negative 1 times 5 to 1. All right, I'm going to do this integral in a second. And we're going to find the total force on this table with this vertical orientation. But before we do, let me ask you this. I have this table with its vertical orientation from negative 5, 5 feet below the top, to 7 feet below the top. Okay? What could I do to find the force on that table? What I could do is take that table and change it from a vertical orientation to a horizontal orientation as long as I'm right at the midpoint. Okay? The force on that table right at the midpoint in a horizontal orientation would be the same as this table in the vertical orientation. Okay? Does that make sense? Because the force above that line would be less, the force below that line would be more, and it would all balance out. Does that make sense to you? So that's going to be a negative 6? I'm saying that I could, I'm going to do this problem out, I'm going to do the integral. I'm going to get a so, certain amount of force. But what I could have done is taken the same table at six foot depth and found the force on that six foot depth table with a horizontal orientation right in the middle. Okay? I'm going to do that right now. Let's do that first. The force is going to be six feet. Okay? Six feet depth. The area of this is five times two okay, times my density function. I'm just taking this table and I'm flipping it this way, right in the middle. Okay? So what am I going to get? 60 rho. That'll be the force on that table. Whatever uh, rho is, if it's 60, uh, 60 pounds per cubic foot, you get 3,600. Okay? Let's do the integral. See what happens. Where did we get 2 from? Where did I get what? 2. The 2 is the, uh, this width here okay. of my table. The length is 5 is 5 times 2. So the white part is the white square is the vertical orientation? Okay. Well, yeah, what I'm saying is, here's my, this is a vertical orientation here, but I'm going to flip it right on the, mid, on the midpoint so it's got a horizontal orientation. Mm -hmm. And if I do that, I can find the force on that horizontal oriented table by taking its area times its depth times the density, which is what I did in the very beginning and I get 60 rho. Now when I do this integral, let's see what happens. I can take the 5 out front and get a 5 rho. I can take a negative out. I get the integral of y, which is y squared over 2, from negative 7 to negative 5. Okay, so I'm going to get negative 5 rho over 2. I'm going to get negative 5 squared is 25, minus a negative 7 squared is 49. So, holy moly, what am I getting? 25 minus 49 is a negative 24. Divided by 2 is a negative 12. Times a negative 5 is what? 60 rho. This is what 
we said we had to get. Okay? Now, can you do that all the time? No, we can't. Why not? Because here's the deal. And this only worked because of that rectangle had a constant length. Let's take another shape. Let's take a triangle in there, where now the shape is changing as well. We won't be able to do the same little trick, okay? Although you can do something with the centroid in, but we won't get into that. So here's the problem now. You're going to be working for SeaWorld, okay? I think they're still in existence after that documentary killed them, though. That Black Fin, or what was that the name of it? What was it? Black fish, I guess that was it. That devastated that uh, uh, sea world. It crushed them. Uh, their attendants were just like, just, just, just. because it basically said the orcas were not happy. All right, that's the bottom line on that. All right, they weren't happy being captive. How many people were being killed? What's that? How many people died already? Uh, there was quite a few of them who worked at the place. They were killed by the orcas. I don't know how many it was, but it was more than a couple. Those uh, fishes are not supposed to be, you know. Yeah, they're not supposed <laughs> to be captive. I know. They're very. Uh, well, captive, captive, but it's a killer whale. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a killer whale. I want to be confined in this little tank and perform little tricks with these people. I don't think so. I want to go kill things, man. I want to bite seals and throw them in the air and toss them around. That's what I want to do. All right, but anyhow, here's the problem. You're working for SeaWorld. And okay, what you're going to do is design a triangular passageway from one tank to another tank. Okay, this passageway. Let's say it's at a depth of uh, 20 feet. And this height is, let's say, 10 feet. And this goes out here at, uh, I don't know, let's, let's go out uh, 10 feet this way as well. Okay. You wanted, you're, you're designing this door. It's like a door. Okay, because sometimes it's going to be closed and the orcas won't be able to go from one tank to the other, but sometimes it's open where they can swim from one tank to the other. Okay, now the question is you've got some choices as to what the door is made out of. You can get a real cheap door made out of some cheap plastic, which may or may not withstand the pressure of the water at that depth. Or you may have to buy something that's really expensive, made out of stainless steel or something, to withhold that pressure. Your job as the engineer is to calculate the amount of pressure on that door so that SeaWorld knows what they can buy to withstand that pressure. Can they get a cheap plastic one or do they have to get a real expensive one? All right, that's the question. All right, as an engineer, that's what you'd be expected to figure out. So we want to figure out the pressure on this. Now, what we cannot do here is take the midpoint and flip this in a horizontal orientation. Why? Because you got more area up here closer to the top than you do down here. That doesn't work anymore. The rectangle was kind of nice. You had this perfect symmetry. You could flip it around. So here's what we need to do. To find the fluid force on this thing, I'm going to take this part of it and double it, okay? because the two are obviously the same. Okay. The integral that I have is going to go from negative 30 to negative 20. The density of this thing is seawater. That's 64 pounds per cubic foot. Okay, seawater, a little bit more dense than. I'm sorry, what is that too? That too is because I'm only going to do this part of the, uh, the fluid force, but this part is the same as this part, so I'm going to double it. Just multiply that. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to multiply by two. And then what's that? Excuse me? This is 64 pounds per cubic foot. That's the density of seawater. Okay. A little bit denser than fresh water. Okay. Now, I'm going to take this rectangle here. So what you're using is the Y. I'm all, yeah, you always do these problems in terms of Y. Always. Okay. So what do I have to integrate? I have to integrate this distance here which is a negative y. Okay. 
I have to integrate the area of this rectangle. Okay, the area of this rectangle is its length times the delta y. Well, the delta y becomes the dy part. What I need here is this length in terms of y. Usually that's called L of y. Okay, I need this length in terms of y. Okay. That'll give me the area of that rectangle times its depth, okay, times the density to give me the amount of force on this one rectangle, sum them all up, get my Riemann sum, and use the integral to evaluate it. So the question always becomes, what is this in terms of y? Now here's what you're going to have to do here. This is a little tricky. What you're going to have to do here is figure out the equation of this line through these two points. Okay, we can do that. What's the equation of this line? The equation of this line is in the form of y equals mx plus b. I know b is negative 30, okay? I have to find the slope of this line. What's the slope of this line? It's the change in y over the change in x. Okay. The slope of this line is equal to 10 over 10, 1. Okay. The slope of that line is 1. The y-intercept is negative 30. So I know that y is equal to x minus 30. Okay. Everybody with me on that? Check it out. Check it out. Make sure you got that all right. So, what is the length of this rectangle? Well, it's the distance from the y-axis, and that's equal to x. But everything has to be in terms of y. So, when I have an x for this length, what is x equal to in terms of y? What is it? Absolutely right. That's what you've got to do in these kinds of problems. You've got to get that length in terms of y. And that means using the equation of that line if necessary. Okay? This integral will give me the total force on that triangular door, passageway, whatever the thing is there. Okay? Now, do you have any clue what kind of force we're talking about here? The total fluid force by this seawater on that door. It's big, okay? It's big. There's a lot of force. Let's take a look at it. You get 128. We're going to do this integral. The integral is negative y squared, so it's a negative y cubed over 3, minus 30y squared over 2. From negative 30 to negative 20. Check it out. Make sure it makes sense. What's wrong? Gester, what's wrong? 64? That's a density of seawater. It's yep. the row. It's the row. When you bring it onto the other side, yeah. It does it stay, if it's a negative, it stays a negative, right? Correct. Okay. How are we doing? Yes, 31. So finished it. No, no, he finished it. He did it in his head. He's all done. He doesn't want to wait for us. That's what he said. I heard him. He said, bah. Yeah, I'm not it's too easy. Okay. Here we go. So let's substitute here. Alright, we get a negative 20 cubed. Okay? Negative 20 cubed is equal to a negative 8,000. And it's negative, so it's 8,000. Minus. Negative 20 squared is 400, so it's minus 6,000. 
จิตดูเด็กเนี่ยเข้าใจเออที่สุดเลยเนี่ยที่ทุ่งคิมที่จะเลือกไปเรื่องอะไรอย่างเงี้ยคุณต้องการที่จะเลือกไปเรื่องอะไรอย่างเงี้ยคุณต้องการที่จะเลือกไปเรื่องอะไรอย่างเงี้ยคุณต้องการที่จะเลือกไปเรื่องอะไรอย่างเงี้ยคุณต้องการที่จะเลือกไปเรื่องอะไรอย่างเงี้ยคุณต้องการที่จะเลือกไปเรื่องอะไรอย่างเงี้ยคุณต้องการที่จะเลือกไปเรื่องอะไรอย่างเงี้ยคุณต้องการที่จะเลือกไปเรื่องอะไรอย่างเงี้ยคุณต้องการที่จะเลือกไปเรื่องอะไรอย่างเงี้ยคุณต้องการที่จะเลือกไปเรื่องอะไรอย่างเงี้ยคุณต้องการที่จะเลือกไปเรื่องอะไรอย่างเงี้ยคุณต้องการที่จะเลือกไปเรื่องอะOh boy! So it's minus minus, so it's plus. Then you get a negative thirty cubed. Okay, and that's twenty-seven thousand over three hundred. So that'd be a uh, nine thousand. Substitute that in. That gives you a negative times a negative. That's a positive, but we're subtracting it. So I believe we're going to get a negative there. Then it's going to be a plus. Because we're subtracting it, it's going to be a plus. Thirty. That's nine hundred times fifteen. It's thirteen thousand five hundred. And that's a plus. Boy, if I get this right, I'd be amazed. Wait, nobody knows what this answer is, right? So hey, this is going to be right. Oh wait, you already got it? No. It, oh, am I right so far? Yeah, you're right so far. Oh good. Okay, here we go. This is why Trent's an A student because whatever answer I get, he knows that's the answer he's going to get on his calculator. That's why he's the A student that he is. All right. That's so, <laughs> so 128. Now, uh, I get this stupid over three stupid thing. All right. But anyhow, um, I got my two positives here. I can add these up. Somebody, what does this come out to be? You got this answer? What's that? So it's this plus this. I can multiply. Oh, I'll just do it. I'm being a baby. All right, eight thousand over three. Million four hundred fifty-three thousand three hundred thirty-three point three three three. Wow! Give me that again. What is it? Two million four hundred fifty-three thousand three hundred thirty-three point three. That's pounds of force. Two million pounds of force. Just get the plastic one. <laughs> <laughs> you put that in there. What's the worst that could happen? Yeah, right. That thing will break in one second. Shamu. Yeah, it's almost like Shamu. Who cares about Shamu with his, with his fin that's off to the side for crying out loud? All right, but anyhow, that would be the answer. Yeah, that's true. Yes? 9,000 is positive. This 9,000? Yeah. I don't think so, but I, let me try it. Negative 20 cubed is a negative number times a negative. That's a positive. And then you got to do this minus. You put the 20 in there. That's positive, but it's being subtracted, so that's a negative. Then when you do the negative 30, it's being subtracted. So when you subtract it times this negative, you got a positive here. And it's negative 30 cubed, which is a negative 9,000. Yes. Oh, so that's wrong. What? Plus positive. I did plus 9,000. It's, it's going to be a minus because you're going to subtract this negative, which makes it a positive. But when you cube the negative 30, it becomes negative. So it's so it's not this much. 9, what is it? It's a minus 9,000? Yes. It's, what you got is this plus this minus 15,000, whatever that happens to be. It's not as big as this. I, I thought that was a little bit too much. All right, so, it's minus, uh, so it's the uh, whole answer is supposed to be a negative. No, the whole answer is positive. It's positive force. The whole answer is going to be positive. If you get a negative, you did something wrong. There you go. 149,000. Okay, that's about 333. Okay, that's about it. Oh, because you're multiplying a negative by a negative. Well, yeah, you're going to have to trust me in all this negative stuff. Okay? When you substitute in a negative 20, you get a negative 20 here, you get a negative 20 here. But you got a negative in front, negative in front, and then when you do the negative 30, though, it's being subtracted, so these will both turn into pluses. Y you just have to do the algebra. That's all there is to it. So is that coming from both sides? We yes. This is the whole, the total force on this triangular door. That's the, the door uh, from one tank to the other. It's 150,000 pounds of pressure. Make it way harder to throw like a function into there, so it's like a triangle. 
Actually, the <coughs> one is easier. It's easier? Than this, yes. Oh, you've already seen it? How many questions are there? Oh, you see it. What is it? It's, it's a rectangle. Um, it's a tank on the side of a, it's a triangle, just like you're doing. Okay. Except it's all, all the way to the top. Oh, well, that's even easier. And it's, um, and it's like six. Okay. The on the test, I don't know. I'm going to have to bring in the test. I'll bring it in on uh, Monday, and I'll tell you what's on the test. Are there going to be like irregular shapes? That's what I'm asking. No, no. Are you going to practice this Monday? Yeah. Yeah, we'll do, uh, we'll do a practice test on Monday. We'll go over the lab, and we'll review by doing a practice test. That's what we're going to do on Monday. What's that? No, we have another chapter. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So yes. What's the official formula for this one? The official formula is the fluid force is equal to the density function times the integral from A to B. Now, A to B are always a, a negative number to another negative number, bottom to top on the y-axis, OK? Of a negative y, L of y, the length of that rectangle, dy. That's the official formula. Everything has to be in terms of y. This will multiply by two because you get half of it. Then you multiply by two to get the other half. The density times the depth times the area. Yeah, exactly what it is. That, that, that's the way to look at it, too. Just what, just what Trent said. Density, a depth, this length times, and think of this as delta y. This is the area of that rectangle right there. Right. That's where these things come from. Okay? That's why, you know, doing these integrals shouldn't be too bad if you understand where they're coming from. Yeah. Because all the other ones are, there are times height. Yeah. Pretty much. You just have to figure out which R and which H. Which R and H, that's correct. What did Trent say? Density times, times depth times area? Is that what yeah. yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. It's the sum of all those, and which gives you the amount sum, which gives you the integral. Okay. Monday. Lab, we'll review. I'll give you a sample test, the kinds of things you can expect on the test. And we'll do that on Monday, and then Thursday will be the test. Jeez. By what time do you want the lab tomorrow? Uh, the lab, what? You said midnight. The one that's due tomorrow. Midnight. I don't care. Um, if you want me to use it in your midterm grade, turn it in before next Thursday night. Because that's what I'm doing the midterm grade. And we could even turn in the second one. Yes. You may turn in the second one, and I'll use that one, too. What's that? Well, you should have a Dropbox thing. Uh, that link that I gave you to my Dropbox was a link to my Dropbox in all the labs. You should be able to use that same link, because I have one folder that's, if you can't get it, yeah, just oh, yeah, that's right. You couldn't get it. That's yeah, right. Oh, yeah, you're the one that yelled at me. That's true. I remember that. Now. Here's the deal. If you can't get it for some reason, send me an email. I'll send you the lab. Okay. Because I tried, like, copying it. It was two lines. I tried, like, I know. I know. It breaks it up into two lines. Some people can do it. Some people who know some things about computers can do it. And other people can't. <laughs> Some people who know things can do it, and other people who don't know anything can't do it. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was. If you have your computer, just grab it. All right. Um, what? What? What do you want to do? Take. Oh, the, take am I still recording? You are. Yes, you are.